Hey guys, it's Piper, and yes, I'm a witch. <laughs> uh, I got that comment a lot, so I'm responding. Yep, witch all the way. Uh, in other news, Amazon has come dangerously close to figuring out my aesthetic. Now, let's get to the 2019 Q&A. I picked 20 questions, which was hard because I wanted to answer everyone like I did last time, but I just got a lot of responses, so I tried my best. At the Needy Dead says, How did you start getting into astrology? Okay, so this is kind of embarrassing, but, like, my interest was first peaked in the mid-90s when I was shopping for school supplies. I bought this Lisa Frank folder that had pictures of the zodiac signs as cute girls, which sounds like a Lavender Town video, but it was just something that they did back then. <laughs> and I wanted to know which sign I was, and I was kind of upset when I wasn't Scorpio because it was my favorite design. But anyway, that's how I first discovered it. At Water Skull Spice says, How did you first get into spiritual stuff and how long have you been into it? Well, as a child, I was always interested in mysteries and the paranormals and I believed in it all very thoroughly, which upset my parents, but they thought I'd grow out of it, except I didn't. Uh, <laughs> when I was a teenager and I got my own internet connection and, God forbid, a little bit of privacy, that's when I started looking up stuff on witchcraft. Now I prefer to get most of my information from books because I don't trust the internet. Well, other than certain YouTubers, but it's easier to tell if someone is batshit on a video than it is in writing. Uh, I did have a recent resurgence of interest into this uh, after a dry skeptic period because I discovered Stargirl's channel and following her instructions on how to see your aura. You know, after years of doubting my beliefs, some hard proof like that, like seeing my own aura was just what I needed, I guess. Jocelyn, which I hopefully pronounced correctly, asks, If I may, can I ask your sun sign, or perhaps your whole chart if you know it, something tells me you're an Aquarius. Close. I am an air sign, but it's Libra. I'll take this as an opportunity to clear up some birthday confusion. A lot of people think April 2nd is my birthday, but it's actually just Piper Sweeney's Hatch Day. Early on in my channel's history, Piper was a persona. Most of those videos have been deleted now. She hatched from an egg on April 2nd, 2016. That's the day I created her and all her social media. But since I couldn't join Twitter and YouTube at the ripe old age of zero, I set her year to 1991, which is my birth year, and made only the year private. But after the persona died off, I just never got around to changing it. And I don't even know if you can change it. So, for that reason, a lot of people think I am an Aries. Well, then, I'm a little bit more stubborn than most Libras. I'm only nice because I'm afraid if I debate someone unfiltered, I'll make them cry because I'm so aggressive. It wouldn't be the first time. Uh, the birth date listed on Famous Birthdays, September 30th, is my correct human birthday. Side note, can you believe I'm on Famous Birthdays? <laughs> I mean, I'm ranked really low, but it's just kind of surreal to me that I'm on there to begin with because you guys know, for all you guys know, I don't even have a face. How can someone be famous and also anonymous? It's just a really weird paradox. I mean, I know you're not technically famous for being on famous birthdays, but anyway, ever since they've emailed me, I've just been so curious to see how far I could make it in life without doing a face reveal. Speaking of famous birthdays, Melanie was trending last time I checked, so don't forget to boost her. Let's keep it that way. So anyway, my persona's hatch day is April 2nd, 2016, and my human birthday is September 30th, 1991. Okay, so I don't want to post my star chart because that could be used for stalking purposes, but I will say that I'm a Libra sun. Duh. A Capricorn rising, not a surprise, and a Cancer moon, which makes me wonder what I'd be like if I wasn't abused. A anyway, <clears throat> condolences. Here's an interesting astrology tidbit for your trouble. My astrology book calls September 30th the day of glaring truth, and I shit you not, the first sentence is, Those born on September 30th are adept at ferreting out the truth and bringing it to light. <laughs> And we all know how I got popular, and it's probably the same reason I keep getting ad-restricted. Though technically YouTube never explained to me why I'm ad-restricted all the time. At Calm Stars asks, What are some projects or things you hope to do in the future? Also, your voice is really nice to listen to. 
You know, I'm always surprised when people compliment my voice because I hate it so much that I almost didn't make a YouTube channel because of my voice. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> uh, one thing I really want to work on that I never mentioned before is an oracle deck. I have several cards planned out and everything, but of course making 50 plus illustrations would take a very long time and it would cost about, I guess, $3,000 to get the project off the ground and there's no guarantee that people would go for it, but it's definitely something I want to do someday when I have the money to invest in the project and maybe more subscribers who are interested in that sort of thing. At Juliana Kitten says, when is your book coming out? Where can I grab a copy? And when do pre-orders start? I was hoping I could pre-order a copy on my birthday, but I think it's too soon. The pre-order start date for Cry for the Devil was originally going to be September 30th, my human birthday, but for computer malfunctioning reasons, it's being pushed back. The release date will remain November 30th, 2019, no matter what happens. It'll be available for ebook first thing for sure, no matter what. But there may be delays getting it to print because I'm a new author and I am self-publishing. The more ebooks everyone buys, the easier it will be to convince bookstores to carry it, though. So, I'm looking into Egram Sparks right now. Ingram Sparks? I can't talk. <laughs> Egram Sparks. I might go through Ingram Sparks entirely instead of and having them put it on Amazon for me, though. I'm looking into that because uh, Amazon support has ignored most of my emails about the glitch in 10 years of sketching. It still hasn't been resolved and they have yet to email me back for several months despite my prodding and they likely never will. I'm probably on some kind of do not respond thing or something. I don't know. I wasn't even rude so I don't know why I'm there. It might be because I had to change my email address but I had to change it because I couldn't send the file through the other one because it was glitching out. But I, like, I sent eight messages to support and didn't get a response. I'm still an Amazon affiliate and a customer, but as a seller, they failed me on every level. I don't get treated nearly as well as a seller as I do as a customer. So, so I'm thinking about taking 10 years of sketching down completely since this hasn't been resolved. At Nose.com asks, how do you come up with ideas for your digital art? As a graphic designer, I often find it really hard to be original in a community full of people who have really creative ideas. <sighs> that is true. <laughs> you know, actually, this is so disappointing, but I don't know. Oftentimes things just kind of pop into my head. It's almost like divine insight or something. Sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it. My last art chat, um, Melanie's astrology reading, was done pretty artificially by comparison. I was dry on inspiration for it, so I just kind of procrastinated until little ideas came to me over time. Like, okay, she's a Taurus, but bulls aren't very aesthetic, so let's make her ride a dairy cow, okay? And let's put her in the school outfit so I don't have to draw Melanie's tattoos, because God knows that would take forever, and I am not up to that, <laughs> so anyway. Anywho, that's why it took so long for that video to come out. The script had been done, including the prediction section, for like a month or so. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. At Azuzu Shadow asks, Do you like receiving fan art? I've been debating with myself to make you some, but I didn't want to make you too feminine slash masculine just in case I get something wrong. So like, help please, I want to send you art. Uh... Okay, I love getting fan art. Currently, no one has seen me present as masculine because I always appear in costume as Piper Sweeney the Crow or don't appear at all, and Piper Sweeney the Crow was intended to be a female character. Unless you count the very beginning of my two-hour deep dive because I didn't dress in, up in costume. I just lazily threw on my crow mask and filmed. So that's why I'm wearing a Hank Hill shirt and that chest binder. It's actually a sports bra instead of the usual Piper Sweeney goth aesthetic, but, you know, I am gender fluid, so you really can't fuck it up. It's okay to draw the female persona. <laughs> and thank you, by the way. Oh, my neck hurts. Ah! Craning over this microphone. <clears throat> At Flower Chai, hopefully I pronounced that right, asks, If you could be a type of tree, what kind of tree would you be? I want to be a Whomping Willow, like the one at Hogwarts. I have a lot of repressed rage built up from stupid people, and I think that form would just help me let it loose. At Fornication 
No. At Fornification 6 asks, Do you ever consider getting back out there, like going on dates and junk? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to dwell on my past traumas or let them keep me from having fun, but I do live in a really small town that's relatively conservative. Even online, you know, I check. There just aren't many people around here that are, that I'm into, particularly women and who are, you know, women seeking women. And I don't even know how I'd sign up for that being envy and all, but, you know, I greatly prefer women and I have a vagina. So I'll probably have to move if I ever really want to lose my virginity and be a slut or whatever. At Cherry84152607 asks, I know music production songwriting is different from art, but how do you get inspiration to create something and know that an idea is good enough to dwell on? Uh, I personally don't pursue any idea unless I'm very passionate about it. So if the thought occurs to me, I don't forget it and I can't stop thinking about it and I feel super like discontent when I'm not working on it, that's when I know that it's worth creating. Other people might find that kind of limiting, though, so I'd say it depends on the person, but that's how it is for me. At Astrin Linus, which I hopefully pronounced correctly, asks, Are there any artists in particular that inspire you or you look up to? Yes. The first three who come to mind are Audrey Kawasaki, Junko Mizuno, and LM7. Kawasaki, for her free expression and concepts, her art is just so inspiring and uh mizuno i've always been a fan of her i've had an art book of hers um, i like her character creation and the unceremonious way she draws nudity and daily life and it's just really fascinating to me and lm7 is a more recent one i don't know anything about this artist but i found them on uh pixiv i keep forgetting the name of that website i always just want to call it the Japanese deviant art, but <laughs> I like the way they create space. I don't know what their method is. It's like a complete mystery to me. For all I know, they start out in Blender. <laughs> it just, I don't know. If they did freehand all of that, then that's really impressive. I hope they didn't freehand all of that. That makes me, that would make me so jealous. <laughs> anyway. Those are the sorts of things I value the most in art, so that's probably why I like those artists. Uh, and maybe later asks, Since your debunk of the Melanie Martinez accusations was so great, could you weigh in on the ac allegations against Vic Bing? Well, uh, I actually don't know who that is, but I probably won't play uh, Detective Sweeney for a while. I'm still kind of exhausted from the allegations against Melanie. Like, don't get me wrong, there was no point when I was working on that that I thought maybe I was wasting my time or anything like that, but since it is a heavy topic, it does kind of drain me a bit, it makes me kind of sad. I don't really, yeah, I just need a bit of a break from that sort of stuff. Aunt Xenia Jenkins asks, how do you have such an apathetic a attitude all the time? I cry when I trip over air. Well, I guess I'm just so self-absorbed that nothing else matters. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, sort of. I do care, just not about the same things most people do, so that can sometimes be interpreted as me not caring at all. To get my attention, you pretty much have to burn down a rainforest or poison the water supply. Anything short of that will usually register as, like, mild disappointment. At Jesse W49636758 says, what inspired you to write your book? Also, not book-related. I'm non-binary and want to change my name, but all my friends refuse to call me by it and keep telling me I'm actually a girl and I'm just confused. Is there anything I could slash should do? Okay, so I'd say bottom line, my inspiration was uh, expulsion and heartbreak, or maybe infatuation break, more likely, but that's not a colloquial phrase. Betrayal. How's that? Betrayal. It's a long, long story, so I'll just summarize with this since we're mostly Melanie fans here. It's a teacher's pet situation. Do not let your professors flirt with you. The second they take your relationship into that context and won't even date you, they are showing both you and your academic career a huge hunk of disrespect. He turned it all around on me and got me in a lot of trouble and... 
Then I was told I couldn't go anywhere near him. Well, bitch, how can I do that? I'm a math major and he's a math professor. So I ended up dropping out because I didn't realize that I was the victim in this situation. But anyway, it left me with a bad taste in my mouth with love. So I ended up writing this story about two lovers who were very passionate but not well suited for each other. There are no parallels between Eretti and Elijah and me and my old professor, but the overall tone was influenced by what I went through because I just was not in the mood to write any kind of happiness at all. Although, it is pretty comedic. Also, uh, for the second part of the question, I think you need new friends. The ones you've got right now are not respecting you. At Raven Navy asks... Do you have any advice for writers that hasn't been given 3,000 times or just any advice at all that really helped you specifically on staying motivated? Start with the ending first. That way, if you're ever stuck, you can just ask yourself, okay, what needs to happen to bring my characters to where they are in the ending? And of course, you can change the ending later if you need to. I changed almost everything about it by the time I got there, but it really helped to have a goal in my mind when I was writing. I tried writing in chronological order before my first book that will never be published ever, and it was pure chaos. But with Cry for the Devil, I started with the ending and everything just fell into place. Uh, Ella Bear asks, Have you slash are you planning on censoring any of your books, releasing uncensored and censored versions? No, but I'll make it clear what's in it by putting a content advisory on the backs of the book so, like, children don't find it. Uh, book one is almost entirely William's perspective, and it is the tamest. It will contain strong language, violence, I mean, duh, it opens up with a murder, of course there's going to be violence in it, and se sexually suggestive scenes. Book two isn't done, but I can already tell it will be the hardest to read because it has a graphic sexual assault, and people who can't handle it will just have to skip the chapter. I'll know I, I know I'll get a lot of criticism for that, but I maintain that there's no way certain people will be able to understand Simone's motives to seek revenge if they don't experience the trauma with her. And it's not written in a way that sexualizes or glamorizes it. I've been through something similar after all, and my original reason for writing it was just to vent. Um, oh, and books two through five will also have graphic, plot-driven sex. Uh, book number three contains the most violence and some gore that may be hard for some people to stomach, but there's one scene in particular that we'll read as victorious or horrifying, or maybe both, depending on your perspective, but anyway. Uh, things start to calm down a bit for book four, and then there's book five back to ruin it for everyone with more gore! Yay, gore! But, yeah, no, I'm not gonna censor it, because... I'm just, like, against censorship. At La Lolita Kitty asks, Are there any significant reasons behind the names of the main trio in Cry for the Devil? I love this question. Okay, since we're on book one, I'm going to assume you mean William, Elijah, and Aretti. William's first name was meant to be a placeholder, but I never thought of anything better and ended up getting attached to it. I just wanted an ordinary boring name for an ordinary boring guy, but seeing as how the name William means strong-willed warrior, it holds comedic value at best. <laughs> and the only thing he feels strongly about is that his captors, uh, I mean friends, really need to break up. Since he's biracial, his name mixes the English and Spanish alphabet and has Enya in it. At least I think that's how you pronounce it. That's how my Spanish teacher pronounced it. Is it different in Mexico? Fuck, I don't know. So, I don't know how to calculate it for numerology. Since the Spanish alphabet, I think it doesn't have W, or at least it didn't in the numerology thing I looked up, so... Okay, but if we pretend Quinones is spelled with two N's and doesn't have the squiggle N, and it just used the English alphabet alone, you get a destiny number of five for William, which I guess fits him loosely. Elijah has a typical biblical name, but the gag is that the word lie is in it. Elijah. Ha! <laughs> um, he was born... Shoot me, I can't pronounce Greek very well. Elias Jakobos Papadopoulos. But, yeah, no cringe. 
cringe at my pronunciation, but his mother Americanized it to Elijah James Papadopoulos when he stayed in America as a child. Elijah himself Americanized it again to Elijah James Walker when he returned to America as an adult, not liking how everyone tripped over his last name and wanting a fresh start and a third spoiler reason for changing his name. Uh, An exact translation of his birth name gives him a destiny number of three, but his Whitey McWhite boy name, as William calls it, has a destiny number of four. The change is significant. I put less thought into Reddy's name, which I'm probably pronouncing in an Americanized way, though I'm trying my best based off of Google Translate's version of it. My excuse is her mother is Australian and is also just trying her best, like me. <laughs> her full name is Eredi Renee Constantino, which, like a liar, I mean, <laughs> a liar. Elijah. 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 <laughs> I can't even say my own character's name. <laughs> has a destiny number of three, both of them. Um, Eredi means virtue, while Renee's meaning changes depending on the country of origin. In Greek, it means peace, so I basically named her Peace is a Virtue. Meanwhile, she has frequent panic attacks, and it isn't unusual for her to pick a fight. I'm kind of a dick, aren't I? At PerryJam04 asks, Where did the concept for Eredi or Elijah come from? Okay, so all of my characters have parts of myself in them. Elijah, in particular, being the main antagonist, has some of the darkest attributes of myself and other things. Um, so, for spoiler reasons, I will pick a ready, the dipshit antagonist, who's far less mysterious. Once upon a time, primarily in high school, my special interest was goth culture and I was head over heels for goth fashion. I did not care about anything else except maybe the environment a little bit. I could never afford all of the cool outfits, so I didn't have a lot of clothes, but I did try my best, so in a way, this billionaire brat with several walk-in closets full of goth fashion is, like, deep wish fulfillment. Everything else about her pretty much evolved with the story and what kind of person she would need to be to push it along. For example, she has to be kind of ditzy, if not intentionally oblivious at times, in order not to see the first major plot twist coming from a mile away. You'll know which one I mean when you get there. Key phrase, patty wax. Facially, I think Eredi resembles the work of Tim Burton, though I wasn't consciously going for that. I instinctively jotted down what I thought were the perfect traits for a kooky goth chick. Uh, And I watched Tim Burton movies a lot from my youth onward, so it would be ridiculous to act like he didn't have an impression on me. As for her birthday, it was chosen based on astrology and numerology rather than chosen randomly. I did that for all my characters, actually. If anyone wants a full video on the astrology of my characters, let me know, because it feels like I wasted my time on an Easter egg that no one will care about or bother to look up, because why the hell would they? Because nobody cares about this shit. (laughs) Shoot me. At Wolfia Girl asks... Hey, big fan, I wanted to ask some advice you may have, um, you might have for some young non-binary gender-fucked teens, younger people like me. I want to come out to my family, but it's not exactly easy. Love you and blessed be. Well, I'm pretty bad with advice. Actually, I'm, I'm terrible at advice. But I can give an observation. If your family doesn't have the vocabulary to understand, they won't understand. Not in today's climate. I learned that the hard way. I thought using more common words like I feel androgynous would be enough, but it turns out my father's understanding of gender is so narrow that he thinks lesbian is a gender. I wish I explained my identity before claiming it in front of him, but it's too late now. He probably wouldn't have understood it anyway, but anyway, before I came out of the closet, everyone saw me as masculine and even joked about how I was more masculine than some men. Then all of a sudden I come out of the closet and all I hear is, no, you're a girl. So basically, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. No one knows what it's like to be a sad tran, to be a trash can. Hopefully your family respects you enough not to invalidate your identity. And I wish the best of luck to everyone in this situation. Who dare text me when I am busy? Who, whom's to darest to text me? It was an automatic text from my bank.
notifying me of a purchase I made like several hours ago. At Melanie Gotcha says, Hello Piper, my question is, which country would you like to fly to or is your favorite and what color do you like? Well, my favorite color is black. The first country that pops into my head is Japan. I'm convinced I've had past lives there because I've always felt very relaxed by the music and language and culture. And I really like their, fi their uh, food too. Maybe that's why I have a thing for pretty girls in kimonos. <laughs> I've never been there though. Um, nowhere I've ever been has felt like home anyway though, so meh. Well, that's it. I did see a lot of people though in the comments of my last video, last couple of videos actually, asking if I do private astrology or tarot readings and I am considering it. I did buy a book on romantic astrology recently since that seems to be what's on most people's minds, understandably. So I'm going to do some more research. Uh, but sometime in a few months I'll get back with you guys on this one and I'll have figured out how much I should charge and such because some people charge multiple hundreds of dollars, but I don't feel like I'm that good. So, <laughs> meh. Anyway, uh, please rate, subscribe, and have a great day and blessed be motherfuckers.